Hi everyone, this is Iyad Murtada from Open Thinking and on behalf of the Sharm and Open Thinking, I would like to thank you for coming to attend this webinar related to the standards in HR. So this webinar is part of three webinars that we are conducting here at Open Thinking with the, in partnership with Sharm related to the standards of HR. And the first one is going to be delivered by Mr. Brad uh, Boyson. He is the Executive Director of Sharm Middle East. Welcome, Mr. Pratt. Thank you, Riyad. Well, a special thank you for everyone who's able to attend this webinar. I know it's uh, middle of the day and it, we're during Ramadan, so I definitely appreciate all of you that are able to attend. And I certainly hope that you're able to get something out of this uh, seminar. It's quite a broad topic. Uh, some of you I've talked to before about this topic. So there might be some information that you've heard before, but I'll uh, explain a bit more in terms of the overall agenda as we go through. As he had mentioned, this is one of three uh, webinars. The first one, part one, I call is a case for HR standards. The second one is called the diversity imperative. And the third one is called an HR standard walkthrough. We'll be targeting doing all three of these over the next uh, week and a half to two weeks. As I mentioned today, a case for standards in human resources. A little bit about me, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, well, let me start by saying it's not about me, and that joke will make a bit more sense later on. Uh, but my name is Brad Boyson. Uh, I am a Canadian national. I've been working in global HR for 15 years. Some of the companies that I've worked for include Mitsubishi Corporation, Royal Caribbean, and most recently I've been working with Hamptons and MR. Uh, I have an education, a business education in finance and industrial relations as well as HR. My HR professional certifications are SPHR, GPHR, and the recent certification, the HRMP. As he had mentioned, I am the executive director for SHRM or SHRM as we like to call it in the Middle East and I'm based in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, I have been a member of the task force of SHRM for what is called the ANSI Standards Task Force since 2009. How this series came about? Well, I have been doing talks at different events over the past three years. Sometimes it's as a keynote, sometimes it's just one-on-one -on -one with different people. And a request came to me about one month ago uh, to create a step-by-step walkthrough, a webinar explaining one actual standard. And I agreed to do that, and that's part of this series, but I also realized that uh, doing these talks, doing these keynotes, uh, a lot of reoccurring questions come up, a lot of reoccurring discussions come up. So part of the agenda in terms of doing this as a webinar is to try and put a lot of information into one single place. What this webinar is not about it's not a history lesson of the HR Standards Project. Again, for those of you who've attended some of our forums here in the UAE or have talked to me before, uh, this is not a new project. So I don't really want to get into the history of the HR Standards Project. It assumes some basic knowledge about the project in history, but for those of you who are maybe not that familiar, let's do the 20-second version. Uh, Sherman ANSI, ANSI stands for the American National Standards Institute. In 2009, got together to start to develop standards for the United States. In 2011, SHRM as well as ANSI approached ISO, the International Standards Organization, to do a comparable project on a global scale. Uh, it was accepted as a proposal and the Technical Committee 260 was established, ISO TC 260. I encourage you to do a web search and look online for more information about that. Uh, was established and the first meeting was held in November of 2011 in Washington, D.C. Currently, there are 35 nations that are signed up as, uh, if you will, uh, supporting the technical committee, of which 14 nations are classed as participants and 21 observers, adding up to the total of 35 nations. The second meeting, and I stress that, it is the second annual meeting for the Technical Committee 260, will be this September on the 23rd to 25th in Melbourne, Australia. So that's what I mean when I say this is not a new project. We're entering the second year of an ISO standards project for human resources. 
A little bit of a disclaimer first uh, about this webcast is what I put together here is one person's opinion. Admittedly, this is a person who's been involved with this project for a significant amount of time, but there are so many other people around the world involved in this project. There are hundreds of people uh, involved with the SHRM ANSI HR standards task forces. There are dozens of people working currently on the ISO HR standards project. SHRM has over 260,000 members worldwide, and one thing I don't want to do is pretend to speak for that diversity of an audience. I should also uh, emphasize that I am a task force volunteer who has transitioned to become a SHRM partner. So in that context, I'm giving you some full disclosure. Just to summarize the introductory information, the purpose of this webinar series, all three, is to advance the discussion on HR standards. That's the purpose. I actually thought about these next two slides just this morning as to transition into the topic, setting the stage for the discussion I'm going to be talking about today. And let's just say you're taking a hypothetical trip to New York City. And the question is, well, what do I wear? For those of you who are based in the UAE, you know we have a very warm climate uh, all, year, all year round, and especially at this time of year where it's very hot. A friend sends you a screenshot of their cell phone with the weather widget. So here's the information that's sent to you from New York. Uh, the temperature is 30, 30, 33 degrees, it's partly cloudy, it's 5.30 roughly in the afternoon. Now my question to you, and it's a rhetorical question, is it hot or cool in New York right now? Uh, what are you going to wear for this trip? Does it really matter what you wear? Do you care? Or are you just going to get on the plane and go to New York and wear what you're wearing now? What's the issue? The issue is HR today is a lot like this weather widget that you get on your cell phone. It seems to be giving you objective information, useful information, but often it's not. You'll notice that on this widget it says nothing about the benchmark or the basis for this temperature. We can make assumptions, but do we know that this temperature is Celsius or Fahrenheit? Let me ask you this. Is there a difference between 33 degrees Celsius and 33 degrees Fahrenheit? Yes, there's a huge difference in those two numbers. That's the problem with HR today. We strive, professionally we strive to use reliable and valid widgets, and often we do, but we do not have a single reliable, valid conversion tool or generally accepted system to connect these widgets together. And that is a big problem with the human resource profession worldwide. So let me enter the section about the argument, if you will, for developing standards in human resources. Having done this project for the past three years, as I mentioned, there are a lot of reoccurring themes that come up. And the first thing I get when I talk to people about this is a, is a very strong reaction. There's three reactions people come up with. One of them is, count me in with enthusiasm. Sometimes these people say that even before you finish explaining the project to them. The next group is, uh, count me out with revulsion. These, these people actually look uh, almost offended by the idea. And the third group is, count me undecided. These are the people that say, I need a little bit more information. The reality is, is that the vast majority of people fall into the first two groups when you talk about this project. They either say, count me in or count me out. I would say that covers at least 90%. So there's a real polarization of opinions on this topic. And uh, maybe you're one of those people who has a very strong opinion on this topic. So this webinar, a large part of this webinar, is designed to get into why do people have such strong and different opinions about the subject of standards and human resources. So the first dividing line, if you will, is um, it depends on how people entered human resources as a job or career, or alternatively, how people currently interface with human resources. What are they doing right now in terms of human resources? You notice in these two, if you will, forks in the road, it's, it's very hard to know uh, some people are 15, 20, 10, five years into their career. What was their original motivation for getting into human resources? But number two is readily available. This is what you're doing now, and when you talk to people on this subject, this is the information they, they give you. 
So a little bit more about the detail of the, I call the cohort, the count me in cohort. What is the typical profile of this type of person? In general, they are hands-on HR generalists. They tend to be working in industries in no particular order like finance, engineering, manufacturing, retail, hospitality. It's interesting to see how many people that work in retail and hospitality are strong supporters of this project. Their personal education, these are a bit more of your numbers, scientific type of people. Maybe they have a background in finance, operations, engineering. They tend to be, as we'd say informally, these are quants. These are people who backed into human resources as a career. Maybe they started in operations and they've worked their way into a human resource function. Or, you know, the more vernacular people persons who nonetheless work in very large, complex organizational structures. These are the primary types of people that say, count me in and count me in with enthusiasm. Their touch point, their points of contact with human resources tend to be the front line, the day-to-day -day operations of human resources. And their HR effectiveness, the behavior that they most repeat is measured by synchronized teamwork or coordinating and prioritizing significant amounts of information and data. So the Count Me In cohort, I've informally given this group a name. I call them the aligners of HR. Uh, count me in, aligners of HR. These are true and genuine HR people. Their HR success is focusing on process execution rather than finding and picking the right strategy. They may very well do both. In fact, there's a good chance at some point in their career they do do both. But the majority of their time is doing HR rather than thinking or pondering about HR. The problem with solving approach that they tend to use in the workplace, uh, this is the aligners most often, is how proceeds why. Again, that's a procedural approach in, instead of questioning the uh, longer term or strategic objective. So now we're into the second cohort, cohort number two, the count me out cohort. Typically, and again, these I admit, these are generalizations. This group tends to be HR specialists and generalists in standalone positions. They tend not to be working on teams per se. Uh, these are people working as consultants, academics, functional HR specialists, uh, supporting functions, or that very common one-person HR department. Uh, it's a very diverse group. There's not a real pattern there other than that they tend to be working in small groups, if not by themselves, in terms of HR. The type of work they do tends to be project-based, or it may be so generalist you'd call it, as they say, a jack-of-all-trades tra type of role. They're doing so many things that are HR, and often the things they're doing are beyond what we'd sort of define as the, the core of human resources. Their education is, is extremely varied. There's really no definite pattern in terms of background and education to the count me out cohort. And their points of contact with human resources, they tend to have clients or customers. They may even have points of contact that are not HR specific. And their effectiveness, that is the behaviors that they do most often, is measured by things like ideology and intervention, and sometimes even persuasion. So the informal term that I've come to to describe this second group, the count me out group, I call them the artisans of HR. And make no mistake, they're genuine HR people too. Uh, their HR success tends to be benchmarked on things like novelty or first mover advantages or the uniqueness of an idea or initiative. Some words that apply to some of this group is they're the visionaries, or they're the free agents. They're very independent. Their problem and solving approach used most by the artisans, as I say. Why precedes how? They're often thinking about an application, and the, the actual application itself becomes almost a natural consequence of the strategic planning. So my first key takeaway from these two very distinct, very separate groups, the aligners uh, and the artisans, is that when we're talking about the topic of international standards versus, say, domestic or nation-specific standards, it really doesn't come up at the beginning of the discussion. People either support or they do not support HR standards on principle. And what is that principle? That principle is, are standards in human resources yet necessary? Yes or no? 
And from an international point of view, I consider that very encouraging, that the international side of things is not the main issue. So coming back to the HR aligners, from their experience, from their work experience, from their day-to-day -day, uh, activities, they know for a fact that there are no, as I say, GARPs, generally accepted HR principles. Therefore, there is no objective and reliable way externally to compare the HR practices of one organization to another. Internally, of course, there are. You control those factors completely. Externally, no. And the aligners also know from experience that benchmarking against yourself is not really benchmarking. And they believe with a passion, when you talk to them about this topic in terms of standards, that using the same peer-vetted language and reliable inter-organizational benchmarks actually empowers HR to be more objective in proving its worth, allowing the better practitioners to more objectively prove themselves in terms of their career and competence, which in turn allows the function of HR itself to earn, and I emphasize the word earn, its seat at the proverbial decision-making table. And how could anyone possibly disagree with that? When you talk to aligners on this topic, this is how they tend to approach you. On the other hand, we have the HR artisans, and they know from their experience that role modeling through best practices and real competition is what really creates growth. They know from their experience that organizations are just too different to have standards in HR, and HR is, is too soft-skilled to be expressed in something like standards. And human capital, if the previous three listings weren't enough, human capital is intangible and it becomes devalued when you actually start to try to quantify it in terms of standards. So artisans, when they talk about standards in HR, they believe with a passion that, you know what, generally accepted HR principles really do exist, either by the market, by academic um, research, or simply by common sense, they say. What they also believe with a passion is that if you add any more rules, any more forms of a compliance into the workplace, that can only harm creativity, stifle intrinsic motivation, become make-work projects, distract from the more important HR issues. And who could possibly disagree with that? Well, you know what? Why do we have to disagree? I actually agree with both of those perspectives. And I want to move the discussion beyond those two perspectives debating each other. So let's revisit the original question. Why is there such polarization on the issue of HR standards? The answer that I've come to is that people perceive HR's mission based upon their personal experience with HR. Maybe that's a little self-evident to you. But what it does is it leads people to start to deductively, and I emphasize the word deductively debate, what is the best way to do HR? That's how this discussion starts to migrate. Two sides debating what is the best way to do HR, rather than to inductively consider what is the best way to make HR even better. So critiquing these two agendas, the artisans believe that the aligners want to use HR standards to turn HR into an even more mechanical and dehumanized process using economic rationale to justify their case. In contrast, the aligners believe that the artisans want to use HR standards to continue to experiment with HR, including pushing personal or social agendas that don't truly fit with either the mission or the capabilities of HR as an organizational function. And in the end, each perspective perceives the other side as being utterly naive. And that's something I've seen so much the other side has seemed to be so naive and ignorant about the realities of HR. And what I also see is that then proving the other perspective wrong starts to become the modus operandi to prove that they are, of course, correct. Let's move to try and find the right question. The problem with these two differences of opinion is that while how best to do HR is the wrong question, it is such the wrong question on this topic, the restated question, what is the best way to make HR even better, 
it doesn't automatically point to HR standards as a potential or logical answer to that question. But what it does at least, that last question, is it rephrases the question in an inductive, not deductive way of thinking of the topic. It requires an open mind rather than closed mind. Maybe there's something we're not thinking about. Emotional intelligence an HR application. If either of these two groups, ideally both, can just step back and examine the issue of HR standards without assuming that their personal experience with HR equates with everyone else's personal experience with HR, and perhaps some of the assumptions we all have about HR are allowed to be questioned, then, maybe just then, there's hope for a more open and constructive debate on the rationale for this project project of HR standards. The economics of standards. One of the most powerful attributes of standards development in terms of its process is that if something does not have universal, universal appeal, by definition it should not become a standard. There's an element of self-selection in this entire process, which also means that if someone's going to participate, and I think this project can sometimes intimidate people, especially on the international scale, you don't have to know everything about HR to participate, but what you do need to know is what won't work in your jurisdiction, what can't possibly be a standard for your area of expertise. If the right mix of HR people get together, and we've seen this so far in the ISO project, we've really seen that. The, the group of people that have participated, uh, very constructive, very open-minded they can and will introduce standards that have universal appeal, are mutually beneficial, and here's the really powerful one. They will exceed your initial expectations as to what is meant by an HR standard. So let's recalibrate the question. Let's make no mistake, valid and fair concerns. We cannot and should not ignore anyone's concerns. Part of what I'm saying with this webinar is that there's a very common pattern of concerns that comes up. But in attempting to fully address those concerns, it requires that this debate stays on topic. So recapping, standards in HR is not about how best to do HR. It is not about a debate between the aligner's mindset versus the artisan's mindset. It's also not a debate about choosing between minimum standards or best practices. That's another reoccurring theme that we hear a lot. Standards in HR is about how to do HR with more credibility. That's what this project is about. I'm sure all of you have heard the question before, or the statement, that if you ask the wrong question, you're guaranteed to get the wrong answer. And I believe, unfortunately, HR has been taught, and some would say sold, that HR credibility is rooted in an individual's competence in HR. I'm sure most, if not all of you, have heard that before. But let's step back and ask for a second. What gives HR, as a practice or profession, its credibility? Not what gives the person working in HR their credibility. Because if you think about it, individual credibility is the only default option when you cannot more objectively answer the question, what gives a profession its professional credibility? All you have to default is the individual. Two levels of consideration. The vision question, the ideals, the top of the pyramid, if you will. What gives individuals working in HR credibility? The answer to that is competencies. We know that, it's researched, and quite frankly, I think that is a generally accepted conclusion. But what about the foundation question, the base, the bottom of the pyramid? What gives HR as a profession its credibility? And the answer to that is standards. How about this? Uh, two familiar gentlemen some of you may have seen before. The debate that we're talking about is very familiar. Let me go through a thought experiment, okay? And, uh, you know, bear with me, because I'm trying to present this common theme at different angles. So let's assume that you have a personal medical concern. 
Ask yourself, how do you personally choose your medical doctor for treatment? A very common answer is personal credibility, the personal credibility of the medical doctor. And often we get that credibility from a trusted referral. But this intuition suggests that credibility is unique to the situation and unique to the parties involved. Okay, let's accept that. But you don't choose a dentist for a back problem, no matter how much you may feel the dentist is more credible as a person or a doctor than your back specialist. So what we're introducing here is that credibility and competence don't necessarily correlate. So again, assuming you have a medical or personal concern, in all medical case, cases, for the vast majority of people, the first basis of screening for credibility is to choose someone from the medical profession, not just a person with personal credibility, which is to say, ultimately, the source of a medical doctor's credibility is rooted in their profession's credibility, not their personal or innate credibility. Said another way, if the profession wasn't credible, you would not go to that person working in that profession irrespective of your opinion on their personal credibility. A different way of thinking about this is use car salesperson. This is a negative stereotype in many parts of the world. Ask yourself, is the negative stereotype a reference to the person or the car manufacturer? HR as a profession, we are the car manufacturers. Make no mistake, personal and professional credibility are both important. And they become mutually reinforcing over time. But one, that is the profession, necessarily comes before the other. That is the person. And without professional credibility, there can be no practitioner credibility sourced from that profession. So in terms of HR, the underlying credibility of HR, of human resources, is often assumed to be either by academic definition, legacy of the role, or simply by those people working or related to HR making the claim that HR is credible. But ask yourself this, is this a valid assumption? If there is no verifiable common understanding or agreement as to just what is the foundation of HR, how can we possibly assume that a person's HR credibility is really based upon HR. Perhaps HR is really just a group of different professions. Or maybe HR is strictly and forever destined to be an art form. The key point is, is this ability to verify is the difference between an art and a science. And that is the role that standards can play within the human resource profession. Coming full circle, the central argument in favor of HR standards is that HR is not as credible a profession as it can or should be. And HR standards is one of the best ways to make HR as a profession more credible. Plus, this brings to light the fact that credibility starts at the base or the foundation of the practice not at the elite top. So a different example I have for you now. I call it the lessons from finance. Picture the following conversation at the proverbial decision-making table. CFO turns to the CEO and says, well, look, in the end, it's not about me. It's about the collective learned opinion of my peers. And if necessary, I can even show you the latest version of that consensus to prove it's really and truly not all about me. On the other side of the same table, the CHRO turns to the CEO and says, hey, look, in the end, it's all about me. I'm educated in HR, I'm experienced in this organization, and clearly I'm sitting at this table, so I must be a very active HR practitioner. But uh, no, I can't show you any consensus amongst my peers because we've never, we've never been able to agree on one. But that's not really important, is it? After all, I have credibility with you, and you're the decision maker, right? And HR proceeds to lose that argument each and every time. Well, the majority of the time. 
So lessons from finance. When and how did bookkeeping become finance? If you think about it, prior to developing standards in accounting, bookkeepers were nothing more than, and we've heard this expression before, bean counters, administrators, and a cost center. Does any of that sound familiar to HR today? Once the bookkeepers realized that only by working together to develop and use a common language with common principles and shared formulas or metrics for benchmarking that allowed for comparisons between organizations, analytics, and that feedback, and this is key, that feedback was then used to improve the profession as a singular whole, not just for the economic bet betterment of a consulting firm providing or receiving that feedback. Then, and only then, could their individual personal value and personal credibility be further leveraged objectively as true finance professionals. Bookkeeping became accounting when, as a group, they realized that principle and standards do not have an inherent truth content. Principles and standards have cred credibility from the fact that they are consistent and independent from any one person. GAP, IFRS, anyone watching this webinar, does those sound familiar? I guarantee you, people who understand those two acronyms, they understand the, the standards project in human resources without any further clarification. Accounting became finance when they realized these principles and standards are linked to the human condition. Therefore, they must be designed to change over time. That's the strategic part of this. And a system needs to be established that reviews these principles and standards on a regular basis. It's not perfect, but it's objective guidance until proven and codified otherwise. Lessons from finance. A logical comparison. If you look at this three by three chart, you're starting in the top left hand corner, you have the minimum. And in the middle, you have the minimum effective. And then you have back best practices. If you use somewhat of an uh, evolutionary comparison, starting with bookkeeping to accounting to best practices in finance, Bookkeeping is the minimum that you have to do. These are the procedural activities that will never go away. Accounting, the idea of being more tactical, having a common standard, having principles shared amongst the accountants became the way to become minimally effective as professionals. And best practices, that's somewhat of an open-ended uh, area of the pyramid. That's the realm of finance. There are pa logical parallels that we can draw in terms of human resources. Personnel, the minimum, the administrative aspects of, of human resources, today or in the past. The minimum effective practices. If you're going to be doing HR, what types of things do you need to be doing to be considered minimally effective? That is very different than saying, what is the minimum? Minimum is required. Minimum is legally required or procedurally required. Minimum effective is where you start to add value. And then best practices, human capital. The name, it might not be human capital, but for those of you who are familiar with the concept, you get the idea. What this slide is saying is that when a group of professionals convene to document the minimum effective behaviors, in this case of HR's professional practice as standards or principles. This enables, it doesn't guarantee, but it enables human capital to become even more distinct, more robust, and more meaningful. And if you think about it, HR is still searching for its accounting moment. So in summary, lessons from finance. HR as a whole has been focusing too much on individual competencies taking for granted that its founding principles are already generally accepted. Both competencies and standards are necessary. Make no mistake, I need to repeat that. Both competencies and standards are necessary to define and guide the lower and upper parameters of any profession, not just human resources. But much like when you look at, we just finished the Olympic Games in London, 
A London 2012 athlete, if they focus too much on training, but they neglect their nutritional part of their training, it's time for HR to become better nutritionists and define just what are the universal macronutrients of HR itself. That's what this standards project is about. Wishful thinking, part one. So we come back to our artisans. The artisans of HR, let's be honest, a lot of them despise the idea of peer accountability. Plus, they don't want to be told that the core practices of HRs cannot be delegated or ignored or outsourced. The artisans, for them, doing the fundamentals of HR relative to internal or external benchmarks of any kind is not what interests them about HR in the first place. It is not the reason they entered HR as a profession. Their personal relationship with their boss or their clients is their job security, or, oh sorry, I mean credibility, which is a market-based criteria, interestingly enough. Uh, it's one of the main, main reasons that they got into HR was that this type of relationship of credibility could be established. To this wish, this wishful thinking fails to understand and appreciate HR's central role in CSR, in corporate social responsibility, and it fails to appreciate and understand the rights of stakeholders who are expecting more from HR. Wishful thinking part two. Now we're talking about the aligners, the aligners of HR. These are the most natural supporters of standards, but they don't like the politics and the personal effort that go, that's required to go into changing a system, any establishment, especially one on a global scale. Workplace, let alone professional politics, it's not what interests them about HR, and it's not the reason they entered the HR profession. Many aligners of HR believe that if they just put together a, a systematic and convincing demonstration of the value of standards, that that's all that will be necessary for their blue ocean strategy to effortlessly unfold without conflict or disagreement. Make no mistake, this wishful thinking fails to understand and appreciate the inertia of vested interests in the status quo. And that's what we're talking about. We are talking about changing the status quo. Follow, follow, follow the money. Thousands of HR consultants and practitioners earn a living from the fact that HR does not have verifiable standards in HR. That is a fact. The lack of HR standards makes HR considerably more inefficient, inefficient, creating the opportunity for some to earn economic rents by crafting what I call isolated artifacts of behavior rather than optimizing interchangeable core practices of comparative behavior. These artifacts of inefficiency, you might even call them HR noise, they lower the expectations of HR stakeholders worldwide and it lowers the caliber of people attracted to work in human resources. When an HR person resolutely opposes the HR standards project, it's worth assessing how this project would impact their income. Terms and conditions. But you know, the one group that's noticeably silent regarding this HR standards project is finance. One of the reasons why is because as long as HR uses terms like human capital or cliches like people being an organization's most valuable asset, finance has absolutely no need nor desire to engage HR in a standards discussion. Why? Because finance defined, formally defined, what is and is not an asset or capital decades ago. As long as HR tries to make an HR case using another profession's terms and conditions while contradicting those terms and conditions, HR will always lose that discussion. And I would dare say look a bit foolish in the process. Smile and wave, boy, smile and waves. When you're having that discussion around the table arguing that human capital is your most important asset, uh, 
this is what finance is thinking. They're saying, they're basically saying to HR, sure, you say what you want to. To be fair, if you talk to many people working in finance about the HR standards project, they will tell you, and this has happened to me many times, what took you so long? What took HR so long? The point is, it's not enough to define your terms. When I say your, I mean HR terms to yourself or rely on the market or vernacular usage. A real profession needs to formally define, that is what standards mean, like a declaration of independence. It's terms and conditions for all stakeholders to see and critique. And that is one of the key purposes of the standards in any applied profession. In the meantime, HR is allowed to use its people cliches for employment branding purposes because it really doesn't affect who has the last word on actual resource allocation. The effectiveness summary. Standardizing the core, not the minimum, not the maximum of HR. Standardizing the core separates the core practices of HR from the person doing HR. It makes the person doing HR more objectively accountable to all their stakeholders, including their HR peers, which gives the profession of HR as a whole more credibility. It's no longer a personal art form subject to personal verification or validation, which allows those who can develop even better practices, a much more credible foundation from which to build upon which allows those who truly do more, who are more creative, who add more value, to further differentiate themselves in the marketplace. Do more. That's part of what the standard project says. Do more. Do better. But we're drawing a line in the sand. Don't do less and call it HR. A proposition that focuses on the basics, arguing that doing so will in fact make best practices even better and more credible is somewhat counterintuitive. It is. You're saying we're going to improve the top by focusing on the foundation. But let me challenge you with the following picture of comparison. We've got two buildings here. Which tower would you be more willing to add another floor of best practices to? The tower on the left or the tower on the right? The tower on the right, it leans through market forces. The tower on the left, it leans by design. This guy still likes the idea of credibility being about him, but that's a different topic. The tower on the left has a credible foundation. The tower on the right has a questionable foundation. Again, I ask you, which tower would you be more willing to add another floor of best practices to? Which tower would you be willing to live on the top floor? This is a list of countries that are choosing to build the foundation of HR through the ISO standard project. There are 14 participating countries right now. I encourage all of you to look at this list and ask yourself, is my country of citizenship represented? Not, why not? This is your profession. It may even be your career. Are you being represented in this discussion? Four final thoughts. I hope you've realized by now that nothing that we've talked about was international. So sometimes when I hear people talk about standards, oh, you can't do it internationally. You cannot do standards on a global level. 90% of the disagreement when you talk to HR people has nothing to do with the issue of whether it's an international or domestic standard. The second point is, you know what? HR's accounting moment has actually already occurred. In the United States, Sherm and ANSI have already released standards in human resources. The most recent one was cost per hire. Uh, it's a topic for a different discussion, but you have no idea how much that is already changing. Such a little thing in the practice of human resources in the United States. Number three, diversity. 
at the ISO level, diversity is so important. The standards will not have the integrity that they require to be truly global unless as many countries, as many cultures, as many groups of people are represented in the development of ISO standards. The good news is that process is really just starting. And my last point, for those people who are adamant objectors to this project, those are the people who still, after any open-minded discussion that you have, they may say, no. I challenge you to ask them this one question. Have they even read an actual HR standard? Because these exist now. It's no longer theory. It exists in the marketplace. And whenever I've asked individuals who are adamant objectors to the standards project, now I ask them this question and not one single person has ever read the actual HR standard to say what specifically in an HR standard is not acceptable to them. Diversity at the ISO standard level will be the topic of webinar two in this series. Uh, I will do an actual walkthrough of the performance management standard in part three. With that, I conclude part one of this presentation. I thank you all for, for your attention. And if any of you have any questions online now that you can uh, text in that you're curious about, if not, you do have my email address at the bottom of the screen. And I'm more than welcome to receive as much of your feedback as you're willing to provide. Any online questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Brad, for this great presentation. Like you said, the, sta uh, the standard of HR is a really important topic. And we are going to open it now for questions.